You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians and the Chris Spangle Show. It is so nice to have you here with us today. And we are very happy to have the new superstar of the libertarian movement. Uh, Brad Palumbo, I have seen your name everywhere. I was just listening to you on Mark Clare's show over at Lions of Liberty. I know uh, you got lunch with Brian Nichols the other day, uh, one of our show hosts here on the We Are Libertarians Network. You're just everywhere, man. Yeah, I have an episode coming out with Brian this Friday. Uh, and thanks for having me back on. It, it's good to be back with you. And joking about the superstar aside, I am, you know, getting my voice out there a little bit more in the libertarian movement in the podcasting world to promote my new show, Breaking Boundaries with Brad Palumbo. On It's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and I also do the YouTube, uh, which I know you know all about it, but for your listeners, it's a weekly interview series. And I've had guests like transgender conservative Blair White and libertarian Republican Senator Rand Paul. And I've got more good ones coming up. So if people like what they hear today, they should check out my show too. More good ones coming up and Brian Nichols. Uh, no, I'm just <laughs> I, I know you had um, Forbes on and when you had Steve Forbes on, I was like, dang, he's he's got Rand Paul. I know Brian's been working on him forever, but you just swooped right in there and you're getting all kinds of great guests. It's so, a great person. I can give you a little a spoiler right now. I have in the next two months, I can't say exactly when, but confirmed Tulsi Gabbard and Justin Amash. Nice. We've been trying to get Justin forever. So that's a big get. Uh, where can people listen? How can they find it? What's the name of it? What's the website? Give us all the good uh, details right here up front. Sure. Yeah. It's Breaking Boundaries uh, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify are the two main ones, but it's on most of the, the podcast services if you look it up. And then I'm also on YouTube on Brad Palumbo, where you can see my beautiful smiling face alongside uh, the others of, of my guest. And the one thing they should really tune in for is the hot food takes. We close out every episode with controversial food opinions. So I did not know that Steve Forbes likes his uh, bacon with peanut butter. And I did not know that Senator Rand Paul hates mayonnaise and thinks there's a conspiracy to get people who don't like mayonnaise to eat it by sneaking it into their food. And this is the kind of stuff you learn when you listen to Breaking Boundaries, my podcast. That's hilarious. Um, one thing, and you are now at FEE, uh, the, the Foundation for Economic Education, a great, great foundation, fee.org, F-E-E.org, along with the great Hannah Cox. And one thing that I appreciate about you and Hannah in terms of your writing is that you 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 both really focus on policy. You focus on you know, just looking at the list of articles that you've written that we're going to talk about today, New York COVID restrictions, the student loan debt, uh, the lending crisis, the HERO Act and, and corruption. You know, you're not you're not out there just hammering the media and uh, critical race theory every day like most right leaning columnists at this point. And I really appreciate that. Why have you chosen to focus a lot of your writing on policy when sometimes it's easier to go for the cheap seats? Well, look, I've, I've worked in journalism for a few years now, and now I'm at the, the Foundation for Economic Education, like you said, full time. And it's really great there because we get to write about policy and economics, but we reach actually millions of people every month. So we're still reaching a very large audience uh, with our writing there. And that's great. But I worked in more mainstream media before, and it's just this tendency to constantly be writing about uh, what's on cable news today, or what did Trump tweet, or what dumb thing did AOC say? Once in a while, I'll still write about AOC when she says something that I think there's a profound economic error in, right? But not just she offended somebody, or she trolled Ted Cruz, or, you know, these kinds of things. And the other thing is, I, I, I am blessed to write about policy, because I would hate to be one of these conservative journalists that just watches CNN all day, waits for something they hate to happen and then writes it up. Uh, and I, you know, I guess there's a need for that. Or there's a demand for it, but I don't find it particularly interesting or compelling or meaningful. So I, I've really kind of tried to grab away, gravitate away from the Mueller investigation, impeachment, partisan, or so-and-so tweeted, or CNN host says this, and, and really go into the policy world because the short-term path to lots of clicks and views and becoming the next Candace Owens or Charlie Kirk is to just maybe just troll the libs on whatever the viral culture war issue is of the day or whatever tweet they're discussing. 
Uh, but I, I think if you, if you want to have a long-term career and, and be someone that is serious and thoughtful uh, as an ideological op-ed journalist, that is going to burn you out quickly. And that's not the, the long-term path for success. So I've really reshifted to focus more on policy. And I, I can say it's a relief uh, to wake up every morning to read the news, follow it, but not turn on cable news once in a normal day and really only pick out the things that I think are meaningful uh, to write about. How do you how do you determine what to write about? I mean, do you just spend all day? I, I imagine like a columnist like yourself or people who work at think tanks like at AEI, like they just spend all day like combing through papers like uh, Alex, uh, what's his face? Like the the uh, marginal revolution guys are always publishing white papers. How do you come up with your ideas? How do you know what to write about? Where do you find the policy stuff? So there's two different, I, I think we're two different groups there. Those people are more academics. I'm a journalist, so I have an ac interest in academics, right? A background in economics, but I'm writing for a mainstream lay audience. So I, I will write about papers and studies, but generally ones that are directly relevant to uh, the news of the day. And they're directly relevant to what's going on. And they have some key takeaway that your average Joe would care about or find interesting. So that's the kind of thing that I'm looking for. So honestly, I'm getting half my ideas from Wall Street Journal. No, it's okay. Antifa has burned down all of, I assume you're in Washington, DC. I am in Washington, DC. And those are, those, are, those are the alarms uh, <laughs> that come by. So no, but I get most of my ideas from a few places. I read the Wall Street Journal every day, their business, economic and policy news. Uh, I get some ideas from Twitter, actually. You know, there are interesting things that happen on that hell site. Uh, and then I actually, and a lot of my older journalist colleagues don't even know what this is. I get a lot of ideas from Reddit, hmm. really. I look at what's trending in r slash economics, r slash politics, r slash conservative. Um, uh, they have a subreddit for everything, r slash libertarian. I was banned from there, actually. Um, it's <laughs> Did become, you, what you do? It's become very leftist. Uh, Isn't it, it? It is so interesting when like normal people, the people that get banned the most in terms of libertarians that I know are the most normal libertarians like you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I'm banned from there. I can still I can still read, but I'm not allowed to comment or post anymore because I don't even remember which take did it, but I wasn't leftist enough or pro Biden enough, I guess. But anyway, I spend a fair amount of time on Reddit these days and I get a lot of ideas out of it. Uh, and I don't think most boomer journalists. I mean, something that's on the homepage of Reddit is a huge deal to millions of people, but most like typical journalists don't even know what Reddit is. So they're just missing this whole conversation. Same with YouTube, right? Like I interviewed Blair White. She gets millions of, uh, if people don't know, she's a transgender conservative uh, YouTuber. She gets millions of views. Honestly, some of her YouTube videos get more total views than your average cable news broadcast. Yet everybody in the media is kind of obsessed with what's happening on cable news and nobody even knows who she is within kind of the bubble of old school traditional media yet she's got bigger reach than than everybody outside of prime time so that's where my focus has, shift, has shifted is i want to have more of these policy conversations and i want to have um more in touch with kind of what young right of center people care about what's going on in the internet age uh and, and then also just policy issues and economics because i think those are what really uh, matter to me and what will matter in the long term for the prosperity of, of our generation. So one of the things that I've been kind of thinking through now that we have seen the end result of talk radio and, and that idea, the ideology that comes out of the talk radio industry that I spent most of my life working in and have aspired to be in. I, I'm thinking a lot about the cliches and the, and the tools that were used to get us to this point. And I don't like a lot of it. And one of them is the blame the media. The media is all leftist. And it's not that I disagree with that. It's that I don't know that it matters so much because of what you're talking about. Like here in Indianapolis, I have the establishment types coming up to me. I had lunch with somebody the other day and they go, I, I check your page every day. You know, and, and if you look at a Rob Kendall or myself, like we have as much reach on our Facebook page as an Indy Star columnist. So when we sit here and uh, talk about the leftist media and the power of the corporate media, it is um, it's sort of giving them more power than they have anymore, in my opinion. And I'm thinking through this idea lately that I'd love your opinion on because you are a journalist and have worked around newsrooms. Yes, the corporate press 
is powerful, but we're sitting here where we have a 9-11 worth of deaths a day in terms of COVID and half the country isn't even sure if it's real or not because they don't read the corporate press. So is is that that narrative of it's all the media, the media is so powerful, is that kind of an outdated mode of thinking for libertarians and conservatives? Well, it is certainly, I think, a tired one. It's certainly true that the mainstream media, the corporate media, is very left-wing biased. Um, and it has, it's getting worse, I would also say. And when you look at things like the New York Times op-ed page firing its op-ed editor for publishing a conservative U.S. senator, uh, making a very mainstream argument about using the military to shut down violent riots. Now, we could debate that opinion, right? But firing people for ideas is absolutely anathema to the spirit of journalism. And so it is a real problem, but I agree with you completely in that it's not that big a deal. I get really frustrated listening to some of these talk radio hosts or big podcast hosts on the right, who I sometimes like and sometimes find interesting, but it's like they're just obsessed with the media, the media, the media. And it's also become kind of a Trump evasion tactic. So yeah. for example, Trump is, is covered very biasedly by the mainstream media. I think everyone knows that. But when Trump says something horrendous, Sometimes I'll listen to a conservative podcast host or a radio host talk for 90% of their episode about how the media covered it inaccurately or got overreacted to it. They're not wrong, right? I agree that the media covered it inaccurately and overreacted to it, but it's like the main story, guys, should be what the president of the United States said. And it's like too often the story is CNN sucks instead of did the president say something bad, even if CNN was overblown about it or CNN melted down over it or whatever? Uh, so I agree with you completely. And I think that's why younger generations are tuning out to some of the, there's a few exceptions, um, but they're tuning out to some of this. It's really the, the anti-media obsession is boomer bait. And that audience is large, but it's shrinking. It's also a great way to build an audience like, uh, you know, and I've done it here, too. And then I started to really think about, like, is this healthy? Is this the right way to go? Because we do need journalists. We do. I love what you're doing and that you're going into journalism and you're working in journalism and you're not participating in the Benedict option of hiding in the woods. And we're just going to have our own little private group over here and be pure Republicans or libertarians. You're actually getting out there and and, and, and engaging other journalists and. Uh, it, it, it's, it, I would caution the audience to think about if someone is constantly hammering on the media, they're doing it because they want you to sign up for their Patreon. <laughs> and that becomes just as misleading as the New York Times. Like there's this great documentary. I don't know if you've seen it called The Fourth Estate on Showtime. And it's every it's a behind the scenes four episode uh, representation of how the New York Times uh, is covering Trump in the early days. And it's just so like, they're just so group thinking and leftist and it's everything you think, but they're honest brokers. It's just, you can agree or not agree with them. It's, every, you know, and so really think through this stuff. And, and I, I guess uh, let's, let's switch to COVID because the media loves to hold up liberal politicians in response to COVID. And I think the most mystifying one is Andrew Cuomo. I mean, the amount of deaths oh in New God. York that occurred in nursing homes is criminal. And yet he's on a book tour and being praised left and right. Can you give us some insight into what has actually taken place in New York and his actual response and how that how that is juxt juxtaposed with his representation in the media? Well, it's just bizarre. Um, and I again, here's here's a good example. The media has fawned over him and it's really unfair, but ultimately the bigger issue is the mistakes he made because those mistakes killed people, right? So at the beginning of the pandemic, he did not take COVID seriously. He downplayed it and listen, so did a lot of people. That doesn't make him evil, but what he did that I, I don't think he had horrible intentions, but he certainly had horrible results is he ordered nursing homes that they must accept COVID-19 positive patients. Now COVID-19 is a serious pandemic and disease, but it is clearly much, much, much more deadly to certain groups of vulnerable people, the biggest one being elderly people and nursing home populations. He actually forced nursing homes, said you can't turn away COVID-positive residents from being put in your hospital. 
And I get what they were trying to do, I guess, was to make sure that nobody was left out on the streets. But what they should have done is created special hospital wards for COVID positive elderly people or some other workaround, forcing them back into nursing homes full of potential, uh, potentially vulnerable people. That's how you get tons of people killed. And that's why New York has some of the worst figures in the world, uh, actually, for coronavirus. So that's the, the, the big pressing problem. Uh, but equally, uh, not equally, but also disturbing has been this way, like you said, the media has fawned over him. I don't know what it is. Uh, there's like weird Cuomo fetishes among like white liberal women who work at MSNBC and CNN. They make like Cuomo daddy t-shirts. Uh, and they actually nominated this dude for an Emmy because he kept going on CNN with his brother and joking around during the middle of the pandemic as people in his city were dying. Uh, so it's infuriating, too, because it's not just the nursing home thing, though that will go down as one of the biggest mistakes in this entire crisis uh, in the in the whole world, I think, uh, because ten over 10,000, maybe 15,000 people died that maybe a, a lot of them could have been saved with a different policy just in New York. But it, he also has done really bizarre things like put arbitrary and capricious restrictions in place. Like there was one where... Uh, well, we're going to close bars at 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. or whatever it was. And it's like, this is such a great example of the nanny state firing. Because what happens when you do that is now the bar is really crowded in earlier in the evening, right? So you're actually making it worse with your intervention that's intended to help. So, and then the, the other thing is they've just been batshit about keeping schools closed. When schools, the science is very clear do not transmit COVID through the population at large, and children are not at risk of death from COVID, schools are really essential to a lot of families and to a society, both for childcare and for children's mental and physical and emotional well-being. Uh, so in, all in all, I, Cuomo has just done a really horrible job, but he's gotten this weird uh, media adulation uh, just because I, I honestly can't even explain it other than there's different sets of rules when you are a Democrat in the mainstream press. Now, to be fair, he's gotten absolutely attacked every single day by the conservative press. So there you are. It balances out to some extent. Yeah, this has been my contention all along, and I'm in so, sort of a weird limbo between libertarians and and like normies. I, I believe COVID is real, and I believe you should like do things to mitigate it, and especially at risk people. But Lockdowns don't work and they don't seem to be working. And you wrote a piece about L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti highlighting something that I've noticed here in that the picking of winners and losers isn't actually keeping people safer or healthier. It's just making people poorer and it's not having an effective uh, it's not actually protecting people from the virus. What are you what did you see in L.A. that kind of highlights that? Well, in LA, it was particularly bizarre because he had this sweeping order, but then there were all these exceptions to it that really didn't make sense. So they had indoor malls open and, and hair salons open, but schools closed and outdoor playgrounds closed. I mean, and the, the, actually the, the, the order, I read it and reported on it for fee, but it was kind of confusing. There were parts of it that if read literally would suggest it is illegal to walk or go for a bike ride to a non-essential destination. <laughs> but then other parts of it said that certain public parks are left open for recreational walking. So the whole thing was just incoherent, inconsistent. And it's like that is not a recipe for compliance or successful mitigation. I think one thing the COVID pandemic has shown us in terms of the botched government responses is that humility is really needed among our elected elite and po political class. It's like they have to realize that you cannot top down plan society. There are some basic steps you can take, but when you start trying to plan the minutia of people's lives and really pick winners and losers, and this is okay, but this isn't, what you end up with is a hot mess and you end up with a, a lot of unintended consequences. You know, so I truly don't believe that any of these politicians wanted to cause a spike in suicides, a spike in mental health, depression, and anxiety, a spike in drug overdoses, a spike in domestic abuse, uh, calls to hotlines. I don't think they didn't want that, but what they did is they were arrogant and they thought they could plan society. And whenever government bureaucrats try to plan the minutia of society from a centralized office in city hall or in the state capitol or in Washington, DC, 
well, you get a lot of unintended consequences because what has to happen for society to function best is to leave decision-making to the most decentralized and individual level with some exceptions, obviously. I mean, rights violations and crime and there are absolutely parameters, but you really have to leave as much as possible up to individuals because they know their situation far better than detached government bureaucrats. Yeah, you absolutely have to persuade people. And Fauci actually gave an interview to uh, the CBS podcast. Uh, I think it's The Takeout, a long 40 minute interview. And he basically said, I would never ask for a mandatory vaccine because the best way to get people to take the vaccine is to persuade them that this is worth taking. And I went, well, this is just going to make some libertarian heads explode because he's exactly right. Like here in Indiana, Indiana, to to illustrate your point, you know, through the pandemic, I host this show that talks to nonprofits and we've gotten a great view of on the ground here in Indianapolis on now here this, you know, we knew violence was going up in domestic situations and child abuse was going up because dead more dead bodies than normal were showing up. But reports were down, you know, like that. That's a very real 300% increase in uh, suicide hotline calls. And really the main uh, source of it was closing schools in that schools are the hub for low income families to, to basically have take care to, for kids to say they need help for all these different things. And that has been the biggest outrage is that teachers unions have really forced schools to close to protect the teachers, which I, on one hand, I get, but I never want to hear a teacher's union talk about woke politics and how we need to help the underprivileged when you just put a ton of women out of the workforce. I don't know if you saw that article. You know, teachers unions really were, have been probably one of the worst actors in all this. I, I agree. Uh, I think the teachers unions can never once again claim to be fighting for the children's interests. Obviously, <laughs> there's a reason there's a, they are a teachers union and not a children's union. And that's because they represent the interests of the teachers, which are distinct from the interests of the children. Now, look, I never wanted to force 70 year old teachers or 60 year old teachers to, back in the classroom who didn't want to go. But there are lots of healthy teachers who aren't um, at risk. And you know what? How is their job any less essential, quote unquote, because we've decided that some jobs are essential and some people's livelihoods aren't. But how is being a teacher less essential than being a grocery store clerk? If we can ask those people to go to work for a lot less than most teachers get paid, I think you can say to teachers, show up to work unless you have a medical documentation or you're above a certain age. And if you don't, we'll just hire other people. You don't have to necessarily fire people in mass, right? Maybe there's money put aside for vulnerable teachers to stay home or do or or Skype in and then you have young healthy people hired to just monitor the in-person classroom. Um, but there's all sorts of situations that could have happened. But instead, there's still schools closed in across huge swaths of this country. Distance learning for K through eight is a disaster. High schoolers, eh, they can sort of do it. College, it's pretty much fine. But for K through eight, it is truly a disaster. We have seen spikes in failing rates here near me in Montgomery County, Maryland. It's actually tragic. I wrote about this as well. There's been um, huge spikes in failure rates for special needs and low income kids. Same with African American and Hispanic kids, right? It, this is so. It's it's funny because the progressives are supposed to be like the the working class, the social justice people, but in many cases, they're also the ones shutting down schools. Yet, who is it that can bear a school shutdown just fine? Well, it's rich, wealthy suburbanites who can hire a nanny or their mom works from home and doesn't have a, or doesn't have a job. And who is it that can't? It's low-income families and disproportionately minority families. So one thing this, this pandemic has really turned on its, on its head upside down is what is progressive and who is willing to use big government that calls themselves a progressive, even when the impact of what they're doing is extremely regressive. Yeah, it's 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 sort of just insane when the governor yesterday here in Indiana said you can't get a knee replacement, but you can go to a Colts game, you know, and and what I've seen in the nonprofits is that they have uh, they've been forced to innovate in a way that schools have not innovated because the government is controlling the schools and how they're going to be open when they're going to be It's the same with the hospitals. The hospitals aren't innovating their way out of this because they're being micromanaged by governors. Uh, So let's take a quick break here on the Chris Bangle show. We're talking to Brad Palumbo. And we will be right back. 
Thank you for joining us here on the Chris Spangle Show on the We Are Libertarians Network. Our guest is Brad Palumbo, and we are talking to him today. Uh, we just finished up talking about COVID restrictions, and I want to talk to you about canceling student loan debt. This seems on its face to be a great idea. I don't have any student loans, but if I did, it would be a major drag on my income. Wouldn't it be a great economic stimulus to cancel all that student loan debt, Brad? Well, uh even in the best of times, the answer to that question is no. But particularly right now, the answer is no. Uh, because, I mean, we're in the middle of an economic crisis and a, a massive problem. We have very limited resources as a society, right? That's the most basic lesson of economics is scarcity. There's only so many taxpayer dollars that can go to so many purposes. Now, there's about 1.7 trillion in student loan uh, that is held by Americans, 1.5 trillion of which is held by the government because they gave out government student loans. Here's the thing. We think of student loans, and this is how progressive advocates like AOC or Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, this is how they would put it. We think of student loans as, oh, these are struggling students who can't afford their bills common instead of dinner. That's not actually the case. So only one in three American adults over the age of 25 holds a bachelor's degree. And in fact, the reason people get bachelor's degree is because people who have college degrees earn a million dollars more over their lifetime. They earn 80% higher salaries than people without one. Uh, so, you, so almost all student loan debt naturally is held by people that went to college. Now that's a relatively well-off slice of society. In fact, a lot of that debt is held by doctors and lawyers who ran up big bills in their undergrad. Uh, and, and the average salary of a college graduate is much higher than the salary of an average taxpayer. So economic analysis shows that canceling student debt sounds like this social justice thing. It's actually a taxpayer financed redistribution of resources from the average taxpayer to relatively wealthier and well off subset of individuals who benefit from it. A study from the University of Chicago actually found that the top 20%, so the highest fifth of income earners, would get six times, 600% more monetary benefit from student debt cancellation than the bottom 20%, the bottom fifth of income earners. So it's this giant scam being pushed by progressives who claim the moral high ground and they're helping the working class, but actually they're pushing out here pushing a policy that would basically just help well-educated, mostly liberal uh, coastal people who can usually pay their bills just fine themselves uh, at the average working class taxpayer's expense. So I think it's it's a, a horrible policy idea and even more horrible in the middle of a crisis. I've heard that student loans, I mean, the, the whole taking over of student loans by the federal government, it had good intentions, did it not? And then it went wrong and it raised tuition. Like, can you talk about the origins of the crisis? Right. So another one of the problems with this just cancel the debt is it doesn't actually solve the underlying problem. Like, what is the problem? Well, the problem is that college costs are insanely high. No one disputes this, right? Like, I don't disagree with left left leaning people when they say the cost of college is way too high. People can't afford it. This isn't reasonable. But the question is why? I mean, the cost of college has increased many times over adjusted from inflation uh, since 1980. What happened during that time period? Well, the federal government created this massive student loan program and started giving out money. And their idea was, we want to help more people go to college. What that actually happened, and I think this is what basic economics would have told us would happen, um, but that's often not taken into account when politicians have uh, their great ideas and schemes, is that they artificially inflated demand for college by issuing these blank checks. We'll give you government loans to go to college. Here you go. Uh, artificially low interest rates. We won't have any eligibility requirements, really. It doesn't matter what your GPA is, doesn't matter what your credit score is, what major you're having. Uh, and then for every dollar they gave out, research shows 60, 70, 80 cents uh, was just jacked up in tuition prices. And the money was just captured by these higher education institutions that have become more like little uh, enclaves and cities uh, with uh, giant sports complexes and seven dining halls and all sorts of millions of administrators who just push papers around and have some crazy title. It's been captured by them and the sticker price of college has just continued to skyrocket, which fuels this debt crisis. So, so the whole problem was created by failed big government intervention. And what are people proposing it to solve it? 
some more of the same. And I think we all know what that is. It's the definition of insanity. We are talking to Brad Palumbo, host of the Breaking Boundaries podcast. Did you think about calling it Breaking Brad? Oh, that's funny. I So I actually, I have thought about that in the past, um, but I actually haven't seen the show. So I would be kind oh. of referencing something I'm not even in the loop with. Well, you're going to have to take some time on your Christmas break to get caught up in one of the greatest shows of all time. Uh, a final question for your final topic here is you just published an article. I don't have it in front of me talking about uh, militarized police. Um, tell me, what did you write about? I'll put it in the show notes. I apologize for not having it up in front of me. How unprofessional. But uh, <laughs> speaking of good intentions, the idea of militarizing the police, arming them seems like a necessary thing is we feel society is getting more violent, but it's actually backfired on us, has it not? Yeah, so about 30 years ago, the federal government instituted a policy where the military could basically just offload surplus equipment to police departments. And so police departments ended up getting aircraft and tanks and grenade launchers and armored vehicles uh, and combat rifles and, and combat knives and all sorts of, they had drone robots that could set off bombs. I, I was reading about this and reporting on it and it truly, scratched it stretched my imagination what i would have even thought and this is not just a small phenomenon this is in uh, about 8200 different police departments across the country have participated in this program and the goal was pretty i think well intentioned like you said it was to make officers more safe and reduce crime that's what they thought it would do but i report on a bunch of new studies that really they just look at the data and that that isn't correct if anything it incentivizes uh, you know, aggression, overkill, more abuse. When, when you have at your fingertips really destructive equipment uh, that you don't actually need for the most of the situations you're in, that lends itself to more escalation. And it didn't make officers safer either. Uh, the data just don't support that. So I wrote about these new this new research, uh, and I also mentioned that Rand Paul and some other people in Congress have bills to reduce this uh, and eliminate this problem. Uh, and their bills are interesting because they would still allow the transfer of equipment because a lot of that equipment is things like paper towels or like office supplies or clothes or regular vehicles. And obviously, like, I don't no, no, no one really objects to that being transferred from military to police if they have extra supplies. But they have a bill that would end the use of offensive equipment being transferred. And I think that's part of the reason I wanted to cover that was because those are the kinds of things that we need to as a as a liberty movement. Uh, start with, because I think those are common ground. You know, I, sh I actually shared my article on Parler, uh, which you know, I think you know of, is a very right wing Twitter alternative. But And I got some pushback from my, I, I have six or 7,000 followers on there, some pushback, but a lot of people were agreeing with it. And that's like very MAGA base. Uh, so I really, what I want to do is look for, on the issue of criminal justice reform, I believe there are a lot of issues where there is common ground between libertarians, progressives, and conservatives. Uh, you know, repealing or reforming qualified immunity is about holding government officials accountable to the people. Rolling back the militarization of police is a small government and civil liberties issue, right? It's a constitutional rights issue, uh, your right to be free from um, abuse and from search and seizure and all of these things. So I think that there is a real opening on the criminal justice issue for someone that isn't crazy woke leftist about it doesn't want to defund all police and become anarchists and think all cops are racist pigs, but also doesn't say back the blue racism doesn't exist. I see no color police shootings. Never heard of them, right? There's this real opening for a sensible third way. And that's where I think Liberty voices and, and ideas are sorely needed. So that's, that's the point of my coverage on that issue. Well, I could not agree with you more. That is the spirit of We Are Libertarians, much to the chagrin of the tribalists on either side within the movement. And we are annoying everyone by being that third way, middle of the road. Why won't you just call everyone evil? And I, I, I promote your stuff. I'm happy to, to have you on any time. And I'd invite my audience to go check out Breaking Boundaries with Brad Palumbo. Go check out your Substack. Please promote yourself. This audience will love Brad when you go follow him on Twitter, Parler, wherever. So please take his advice. Where sh where can they find you? Well, the number one place is to just go to Twitter, Brad underscore Palumbo, P-O-L-U-M-B-O, -O, because right there you'll have the, in the pinned tweet all the podcast links. And that's what I hope your listeners, because 
I know you and Brian and people that we are libertarians, you've built one of the most successful libertarian podcast networks and podcasts that I know of. Um, and I think that's impressive. And that's the audience I want to reach with my show too, is both conservatives, libertarians, uh, anybody who's open to these ideas and these conversations. So I really do encourage your listeners to check it out. It's Breaking Boundaries on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And I'm also on YouTube. Uh, and uh, if they follow me, they will soon realize that I have food takes that are uh, even worse than yours. <laughs> Listen, I'm a lover of all foods except olives, which taste like dead flesh. I will never put those in my mouth again. They're good on pizza. No, they're not. No. You get the Supreme Pizza from Papa John's, which is a delicacy here in Indianapolis, and it just ruins the whole pizza, Brad. I think it's delicious, and I will <laughs> fight to the death on that one. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much. You elitist, I swear, with your olives. All right, thank you so much to Brad. Thank you to everyone listening to The Chris Spangle Show here on the We Are Libertarians Network. We appreciate it, and we hope to see you again next week. And please go follow Brad, go follow We Are Libertarians, and share, share, share. share. All of us normal, like-minded people need to stick together. Thank you, and we'll talk to you again next week.